Let me get my mic on. Okay, can everyone hear me? All right, good. All right, hi, folks. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about freeing the research papers, and we'll get a little bit more into that soon. Um, so this story kind of starts December 15th. I was at work in the office. Um, and I had about 1.2 million rows of data. That was my data set that I was working with. And I have about 83 potential features. So that's the number of columns in my data set that you know, were cleaned and we kind of had an understanding of. And my job was essentially to cluster them. I had, it was a clustering problem. Um, at that point, we had done exploratory data analysis. We had kind of talked to domain experts and figured out some key features we should cluster on. Um, and that was my job. So I kind of dug into it, pulled out scikit-learn, started playing around. I used the k-means clustering technique. I used an agglomerative clustering technique, got it a bit into hierarchical cl clustering. And then I tried a DB scan clustering technique, which is a spatial clustering technique. And I really like DB scan. I hadn't played around with it um, before, and it was kind of interesting to work with. Um, so one of the things about DB scan is there's actually a parameter to the model called an epsilon value that specifies the maximum distance between two points for them to be considered in the same cluster. Um, parameter tuning, and you know, had I known about Kevin's um, technique yesterday from his talk, maybe I wouldn't have had to speak about this, but I was not about parameter tuning. So I set out and I did some Googling and I tried to figure out if there was a newer version of the DB scan clustering technique or an improvement on it that was out there um, that would kind of help me out. And I did. I found a paper um, out of the University of Munich in Germany um, that was written in 1999 um, that describes the technique to solve my problem, which is not have to tinker with the epsilon value for my model. It's not a clustering technique per se. Um, if you're interested in learning more about that, there's the link to the paper. Feel free to check it out. Um, and so I set out to what I usually do when I find a new you know, machine learning technique or a modeling technique. I went over to the scikit-learn website, and I Googled optics clustering. And this is what I came up with. There was nothing. And so I had a panic attack, because that means there's no way I'll ever be able to solve this problem. Um, but there was. Um, I'm paid hourly, so I thought, is there a way for me to turn this research paper into something that I can play with, into code that I can play with? Um, and it took me a while, but I get paid hourly, so it was a good thing. Um, and so this talk is going to be the techniques and the lessons I learned um, taking this research paper and turning it into a project or a bit of code that I was able to publish online um, and put up there. So the first thing that you have to do is RTFA, which is read the fucking abstract. So many people don't do this right. Like actually read it, get a sense of the mission of the paper, the purpose of the paper, why these two, you know, four intelligent people decided to spend years of their life doing this. Um, you can get a sense of that from the abstract. So please do read the abstract. Second thing I did was look at the pretty pictures. Pictures are very informative. Um, they kind of get you a sense of where the paper is going, and they orient you in a proper direction um, in order to understand the paper. So look at the pretty pictures. And then again, you want to translate the ancient hi alien hieroglyphics. I am not a fan of math. I, some point in my life, I wanted a PhD in applied math, but then I was like, that's never going to happen, and it hasn't happened. Um, so I try to always kind of give meaning to those symbols that you often see in research papers. The way I see it is, if you see these squiggles, think set in Python. If you see these squiggles, think about iteration, so for loops, or list comprehension. And if you th see these squiggles, think about or Boolean logic. So you're not, your or, and your and in that order for those specific symbols. You know, the next thing that you want to do if this is, you know, computational paper, a paper outlining an algorithm, you'll find some pseudocode code on it. So take a peek at the pseudocode, read it, understand it, um, you'll be good to go for now. And then at this point, you're going to RTP, which is read the paper after you've done all that. So at this point, you're kind of aware of the context that you're working in and what direction you're going to be headed, and what kinds of things you're supposed to be understanding, um, it'll be much easier than just you know reading the abstract and diving into the paper. And then what you're going to do is write pseudo Python. Mm. The way this happens is you take a block. So this is in the paper um, for optic clustering. It's a definition describing a function to find the core distance of a point. Um, and you'll notice just reading through it, you've got an if statement there. Obviously, you've got a lot of variable definitions. 
So I just took that and I wrote it into what I thought would be Python code. This is the first version of my function. Note that in no way does it work. This doesn't work at all, it makes no sense. But what I've done is I've transferred the language in this paper and the symbols and the math that you know are usually really overwhelming into something that I understand and something I'm comfortable with. And in a way, it's way easier for me to debug this and kind of work through that than it is to figure out what's going on from that. So that's very important. And then you're gonna read the paper closely and then refine and fix that pseudo-Python until it's um, better and better. And you're gonna repeat that about 9,000 times. Don't get frustrated, it happens to all of us. I worked on this for like two weeks, nonstop, nine hours a day, um, and it eventually happened. So that was great. And then at the end of all that, you're gonna write tests. So this is a quick little test I wrote for um, the optics clustering technique. Um, I used some basic data points that I kind of had an idea of how they should be clustered eventually um, and wrote some unit tests for it. And then once you've passed those tests um, and you're done, make sure you share it because this is what it's all about. It's, you know, we, I feel as, you know, programmers in Python, we have this really robust library called scikit-learn and when it doesn't work for us, we freak out. Um, but don't freak out, just you know, look at the paper, understand it, produce the code that relates to it, um, and then publish it online, you know, keep, keep the movement moving. And at this point I'm done, and I, I went through this really fast, which I guess just happens when you talk like a really fast person, but that's more time for you guys to ask your questions and give comments and rants and any like deep confessions you have. Question. What's your top level domain? Is that dot com? My top level domain is Sophia.rocks. There is a top there is a dot rocks top level domain. Get on it, folks. <laughs> Did you contact the original authors and ask them if they had code to share? No, I didn't. That's a good idea. I should have done that. But I um at that point I was more interested in kind of just learning this by doing it is the best way to do it. Um, and kind of really immerse myself in the process. Um, and there was actually code out there for optics clustering, but I was like, no, I wanna really understand this and do it myself. Um, and also that code was messy. So uh, at, at the beginning of the previous <coughs> century, I guess, so there was this program of constructivism in mathematics in which uh, uh, when, when you had the theorem, they wanted to show a computational view of how to actually achieve the result. But the problem was always, you know, essentially, well, existential quantifiers. So we are even dealing with the real numbers. So, but by this, wha what I mean is this: I mean, not all theorems in papers can be instantiated in code, right? And yeah. some tells you that something exists, but you don't know what where it is. So, yes. uh, so I guess um, that's sort of like what domain you're working in. Um, so this was specifically a machine learning paper, and not only a machine learning paper; it was an algorithmic paper. So they had to be able to show pseudocode and kind of explain not just the theoretical math behind why that worked, but how you could implement it. And if you notice, um, a little bit ago, I showed that they had pseudocode in the paper. So this kind of is specific to certain types of papers, um, but I feel like the, the papers that this works for are very prevalent in machine learning and in computational science. Frequently, like, read papers and implement them, or was this just like a one-time? This was my first time doing it. Um, I haven't done it since because I haven't had the opportunity. Um, but I decided to kind of outline that process and put it out there. How often do you find errors in papers when you do that? Uh, you know, sometimes people skip on uh, parts of the implementation. Uh, so if you just implement the paper straight, actually may not work. Uh, do you, does it happen to you? Yeah, I think when that happens, you have to be able to read it. Um, so I remember another situation where I wasn't implementing it. Um, but there was, um, sorry, I'm trying to remember the topic I was looking for. Um, it was rare event prediction. Um, so, you know, given time series data, um, can you predict when something unique in the data is going to happen? And in that case, they were actually referencing a genetic algorithm technique that was not outlined in the paper. So in that case, I had to go out, um, you know, look in the references and then find that paper and implement it through that. So sometimes you just have to kind of like, look through all the possible papers when they explain a word and just go through the references. 
but rarely is a paper incomplete uh, in that sense. Uh, other questions? What's the uh, next paper you're gonna do? Oh. You know, that rare event prediction paper, I actually um, started working on a library for it called, um, called Endive, and I was working on it for a couple, um, couple weeks in January, and then I just got so busy with life and everything, and I haven't touched it then. But it's in progress, so I'll probably finish it at some point. So the authors of that paper after you had published the code? No. Mostly because I was like code shy and suffered from imposter syndrome, like Mark touched on yesterday. It's like, no one can say this, even though I put it on my GitHub. I, I cannot help you to think it would be wonderful if uh, parallel to a paper repository there would be a code repository for the people who then replicated the papers, uh, even if the original authors didn't want to share the, the code, right? So that then you could uh, download the code and try it for yourself. So yeah. is there anything like this that you have uh, ever seen? I have not searched for it, but uh, have you? That website, researchcompendia.org. Attempt at it. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a yeah. So this is fairly an old paper, 1999. Um, but hopefully in the future, um, people like me won't have to do stuff like this or give talks like this because the researchers will just provide their code in Python. Any other questions? Huh? There was Almost so many bugs. Um, it ended up just being essentially the same result I would have had, like tinkering with DBSAN clustering, because um, what optics clustering does, it doesn't necessarily produce um, the actual clusters. It produces an ordering of cluster data, um, which I then just kind of like looked at and visualized and got similar to what I would have gotten had I done DBSAN clustering. So fruit fruitful in some senses. I think they're about to kick me off stage. No, not necessarily, but are there any more questions? Okay, then yes. Uh, yeah. thank, thank you, you. Uh, thank um, you again. This talk is on my website if you want to go to sophia.rock forward slash dpi2015. Um, you can find it there.